the way we're going to do this is I've invited each of them. Just come up on stage. We're not going to do like formal intros because I hate that. I just tell you that these are all my friends and these are all lovely people and they're all super involved in fashion um, in different ways. So you know, through the way I mean, through their talks, you learn a little bit more about them. Um, the way sit. <laughs> Maybe I can sit here. And uh, <clears throat> through the talk, so the way we the structure this particular funda is that I've asked each one of them to make an opening um, introductory uh, statement or provocation uh, about you know what this intersection of fashion and social media actually means to them. Um, so we'll have opening comments by each of them. Some of them have made slides, some of them haven't which will kind of be informational for all of us to get a sense of them and their worlds. And then we we'll open up to question and answers. I have lots of questions. <laughs> Actually, I have some answers as well. Um, so maybe I'll send, give you all the answers and then you all ask questions. No. But what we want to be really fun is that we all have all these questions. We all ask questions and we can make it a participatory um, um, uh, engagement. It's, you know, it's fashion and it's social media. So if you want, you can, you can tweet it to us. It's hashtag Friday Funda. And, you know, we'll all be looking at our phones. Uh, during the comments. It doesn't mean we don't love you, it means like we're applying your tweet or whatever. So which means, you know, take out your phones and take pictures and like put it online because, you know, it is about fashion social media. So with that, I want to invite, um, who wants to go first? Marlene, you want to go first? I want to invite Marlene to come and make her opening provocation. You can do it from there, you can sit here, whichever way you'd like. Alright, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Um, so first, I just want to say it's a huge privilege to be invited here, and thank you so much for Mish and Kinanika for introducing me. I've just been so inspired walking around the space here and, and meeting everyone who's doing something like this, and it's a really great honor to be here, so thank you for having me. Um, sorry? Click on the screen. Okay, great. So we're nice and high-tech here. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Malini Agarwal, and I run a blog called MissMalini.com. This is who I think I look like on the internet. Um, so just a little background on me, I started this in 2008, started doing it full time in 2011. Now, just to cut a long story short, I have about 1.8 million followers across different forms of social media, basically because everybody loves Bollywood and fashion and lifestyle. I'm just gonna run through these a little bit um, quickly. I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about building an online brand, because I started out as a hobbyist blogger, and that's, I think, very different than when you wanna run a business. So these are the five things which if you ever do plan to run a business or you, you and Parmesh are, are going to change the world very soon here, these things I think are good to keep in mind. Mind the gap, which means do your homework. What is missing in the world that you could bring to it? Uh, and it doesn't have to always be a save the world one, like I'm not saving the world with Bollywood gossip, definitely, but I'm probably adding something to it. What I thought, um, and I think that the Godrich Lab and the India Culture Lab really represents this is it really used to bother me when people would only talk about India as you know villages or show uh, you know poverty, and, and absolutely that's a large part of you know our country. But I think there's another side to it that no one really talks about. Nobody talks about the fact that there are such amazing people meeting every day and coming up with solutions for the future. Uh, nobody focuses on. I mean, the India I've lived in for so many like decades now is is about luxury and fashion and culture and, and so many things. And that's why I created this girl who I felt represented me online, and she obviously will age a lot better than I will. Um, but she sort of represents the, the quintessential Indian, modern Indian girl who is very comfortable with her culture, but is not you know, forced to you know, adhere to any particular norm. So she dresses the way she likes, she likes to travel, she likes fashion, she likes food, but she will dance to a Bollywood song at her best friend's wedding any day of the week. Um, and then we gave her a makeover in 2013 and we put her in a masaba sari because I love the colors and the kitsch of it and gave her like a fancy bag and, and just also a way to sort of show uh, an Indian icon because I feel that we don't have a, a Barbie or a Hannah Montana who please it and uh, I'm going to be as bold to say that maybe we, we should and maybe this could be her. A couple of things to do that are good to keep in mind. One, get a great team. Remember your team should reflect the brand and who you're trying to build. I chose this picture, I'm sure you can guess why. I'm very particular about grammar and punctuation and things like that. So, and respect your audience, make sure that you build trust. And that's why, for instance, on my blog, I would never promote fairness creams because I think that's a real problem and it sends the wrong message and, and gives us a bad self-image. Uh, and you have to be patient, whatever you're doing. And I think Formation knows this, you work every day and you build the future from that. 
Um, I sometimes feel like these chickens and I, and I want it to happen now. Uh, talking about social media, these are of course platforms that I'm sure you recognize, a lot of tools that we all use. But I don't know if you know that if you zoom out, the landscape is actually massive. There are these many and more social media tools. The best thing to do is do your research and find the ones that suit your brand and what you're trying to achieve. I can share the slide with you later if anybody's trying to zoom in and look at it closely. And finally, of course, spread, you know, create good content, leverage your assets, and you can also, there's a lot of tools that you can buy and pay for to improve your brand. So these are all the things that I did. Uh, having said that, our entire growth has been organic, which I'm very grateful for. And it doesn't stop there, you know, especially online, you're, you're only as relevant as your last tweet or blog uh, or YouTube video. So you have to maintain and manage your content. Remember that there is a very short cycle of response and feedback. Uh, and there are two types of, of responders that I've realized. One, that are just malicious and mean, and they just want to say, I hate you every day on Twitter. And then the other ones who have constructive criticism. So know the difference, ignore the ones and stay above the fray, uh, but always respond to the ones that really are trying to reach out to you. And as I mentioned in a, in a talk earlier this week, there are some skills that, uh, some, some tools you can use to see how well you're doing online. Peer Index Cloud, there's just a few of these, but this will tell you how well you are uh, using the tools and, and your social media. And just moving on a little bit to celebrity, I think it's amazing that all celebrities now are, are engaging and, and embracing social media. So we do Google Hang Hangouts on a regular basis, and this is the Will's coming, upcoming Will's Fashion Week. We're going to be doing live hangouts from Will's because I think people want to see what's happening now. We started doing something called, I like to call this Twitter View, which is Twitter interviews with a, you know, with a fashion designer or you know, of somebody who really knows her fashion, like a Sujata or a Nanita, and, and talk about, make these conversations so I think it feels more accessible to people on, on social media. It doesn't feel like it's only something really fancy people do. Um, and then one of the things that I've, I've strived to do on the blog is try to do real girls in real fashion. Like I'm not a six foot supermodel by any stretch of the imagination, but I wanted to tell the story that look, I want to look good and feel good. And maybe I can help real girls do that, and it's less intimidating if I do it on my own body, because I, I may not have the perfect physique, but I, I know the things that will suit me, and that's how I can also help uh, brands reach out to the audience they want to reach. Celebrity style is also a really interesting thing, and I find that people do look at celebrities and they say, wow, I love sort of the poor style, but let's be honest, no one's going to go buy the, you know, very few people will go buy the four lakh Gucci bag, right? Uh, but there is a way to, to be stylish and create those looks for yourself on a much smaller budget. This is like maybe under 8,000 you can create all of this and you, you can spend even less. But it's also just, I feel that blogs, what they do is they open up that landscape uh, for your average consumer who might be shy to have a conversation about fashion with permission, for instance. Because <laughs> always, you know, so well stylishly put out and maybe it's less intimidating when it comes from a blogger. And finally, so for example, one of the ways we work with brands is with Flipkart, they have over 850 brands. But suppose you want to go buy a pair of shorts. You'll go on Google and be like, I want to buy shorts. And you'll get 6,000 you know, million pages and you won't know what will suit you, what's trendy. So for instance, these are pictures from Black Me Fashion Week. And so we knew that monochromatic was, you know, the monochrome trend was back and it's, it's really heavily used. So how can you replicate that and create that look for yourself on a budget that you can afford? So suddenly the average consumer is being fashionable, um, but they're still relevant and they're, they're connecting to high fashion. And um, so is social media the new front front row? I wouldn't say it's the new front row. I would say it's an addition and a happy one. Uh, I still love the idea of hooking up a glossy magazine. I love how they smell and they look and they shine. Uh, but I think that in the need of today, there is a huge opportunity to do real-time multimedia content, and that's what we do. And all the things I just talked about, we do that by being front row at the fashion peaks and seeing what's happening and then translating that in a very simple way for the consumer so it's not frightening. Um, and since 2010 at Lacme, actually, we started sitting front row. And honestly, it's a much better, easier way to take pictures of the clothes rather than have heads in the frame. So that's a very, you know, basic reason that it's great. But I think it's, I think it's also, um, and I think, I'm sure, uh, you know, Sake will talk about that more, it's also that Black New Fashion Weeks and people in fashion are starting to recognize the value and the content that bloggers bring, and I really appreciate that. But I really don't think anyone has to replace each other. You're just growing the family. The question is when you got that front row seat, who left that front row seat? <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask that, that question. <laughs> so that's it for me. Thank but you. Thank you. No questions, we, you know. I, I want all the panelists to present their opening provocations and then we do questions later. So with that, since you mentioned Sarkis, Sarkis, <laughs> you're next. Uh,
give us the gossip, Saket, it's a Lakme Fashion Week, give us, give us your take and also give us some insider gossip, what really happens. Okay, good evening. First of all, thank you very much for getting me on the panel and uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for, for as a Lakme Fashion Week organizer to talk about the various uh, social media initiatives that we've taken. Just to give you a small background of mine, uh, I uh, I have a very conventional background in education. I did my chemical engineering from your neighborhood IIT Kauai, and I am a marketing and a finance major from IIM Calcutta. And since the world of engineering and management, it's been a journey of 10 years in in the world of fashion, and I've done about more than 80 fashion weeks in the last 10 years. So, uh, social media interests me very much because I've been involved as a sponsor also and as the organizer. Obviously, social media is the future and that's why I'm so excited about this talk. So, just to uh, see, Fashion Week is at the forefront of fashion. Fashion Week is where the friends, they get showcased by designers to the entire world. So let me define uh, for all of you what Fashion Week essentially is. You know, I'm sure all of you have a perception Fashion Week is all about glamour, style, buzz, Bollywood. But a Fashion Week is essentially a trade, it's a B2B event, okay? Wherein uh, designers, they promote their collections six months in advance to editors and retailers. Okay, I, I'm sure all of you are aware of the fashion supply chain. You know, which is a one year long cycle for six months designers take to conceptualize their collection and after six months they showcase it at a fashion week and the next six months they take it to deliver it to the stores. So it's a long complex supply chain that fashion has and fashion week sits in between that supply chain. So it's a strict exclusive event, not everyone is invited. We have 30 shows running over five days. There are about 500 seats for each show, which are uh, which are segregated between buyers, media, sponsors, designer. So, so if a layman or a common person on the street doesn't uh, have any chance to uh, visit a fashion week. So, what I'm trying to tell all of you is that there is a major. So, the question is not about the front row. Front row is only one one small part of fashion. The question is that social media is completely disrupting the world of fashion, okay? And when I say that, what I mean is it is disrupting the supply chain, it is disrupting the basic values that fashion is built on, it is disrupting the power equations, it is changing the media behavior, it is changing the consumer behavior, it is changing uh, the lack of organized retail in India, and it is changing a lot of principles which are associated with fashion, okay? And with the help of lack observations of LACME Fashion Week, I'll take all of you to great detail on how these things are happening. So first thing is, as I told you, uh, a Fashion Week showcases uh, something that will come to you after six months, okay? Now with social media, people are not willing to wait for six months. If they like anything, they want it now, okay? So, so we are moving into a world of fast fashion and social media is driving that. Fashion and Fashion Week are all about exclusiveness. It is about elite. It is about the premium. The premiumness is derived from the exclusivity. Okay? But right now, one of the key values of LACME Fashion Week is we want to be inclusive. We want to be collaborative. Okay? We want everyone to come and visit our event. So the values are changing. That's also driven by social media and I'll give you a few examples. Power equations are changing. Gone are the days when the big designers were getting bigger and the younger designers had no platform to showcase themselves. Okay? Or whether it's a, a blogger nowadays in America essentially is as uh, influential as a Vogue editor. Okay? So the power equations are changing thanks to social media. Paid media, I am sure all of you appreciate and understand that we have something called paid media in India by which if you pay if you pay for that particular event or for that particular uh, collection, you will get featured. But social media doesn't behave like that. So the online thing that comes in Bombay Times and online is not news? <laughs> no, it's, it's not news. Now you're telling me. <laughs> so, Damn. So, so for example, the Bombay Times or HTCP, they cover things which are sponsored. Did you know that? <laughs> All right. So they cover things which are sponsored, oh. which are... 
So they essentially cover things which are paid for, which are, you know, sponsored or... I should move out of Ikrali more, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See this weird world we are living. That's why your picture is not coming in paper. <laughs> 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 You know, in fact, I was surprised. I was surprised. I counted there were some 75 Bollywood stars at Black Mirror Fashion Week apart from other socialites and there was pictures of 3-4 random people which came in the paper. And I was really at a loss to understand that why is Bombay Times doing this to us? That few <laughs> random people whom no one knows, they said they were spotted at Black Mirror Fashion Week. So that's the answer, so, you know. <laughs> so, now, earlier Fashion Week was all about action which was happening on the ramp. Now the action is shifted from ramp to outside the fashion week, okay? In Milan and in Paris, there is there is a parallel fashion week which happens, okay? Which is something called street style, okay? Photographers are not interested in going to the show area. They are interested in outside. What are guests wearing? What are the exciting looks that they have? No one is interested in what is happening on the ramp. So it's a big difference, uh, you know. It puts the very question of fashion week. Should we have a digital fashion week? You know, what is the point of having a fashion week if people are not interested, okay? Organized retail, as all of you are aware that organized retail in India is has a lot of its complexities because of the real estate, expensive real estate and other governmental, other bureaucratic problems involved. So e-commerce here comes in, okay? And is enabling even younger designers to sell their garments across India. Fashion was all about ego, okay? But the new buzzword in fashion is democratize, okay? So, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, we should not, uh, the front row of fashion is being democratized, okay? And it is being driven by social media. Three three years, four years down the line, I I doubt there will be a fashion week, but yes, there will certainly be fashion shows and the front row will be given to the person who is watching it on internet, okay? So that's my, so, so these things I will obviously highlight with examples from Lakme Fashion Week. What I'm saying is that social media is redefining the front row for fashion, okay? And what I'm saying is that the quality of live stream, okay, is changing. It is becoming more interactive, okay? So just look at the various innovations which are there. For example, there's a Google front row <coughs> where you can, you know, change the angles, you can zoom in, okay? And you can, so the viewing experience is much better than the front, when you're sitting in the front row, in the actual front row, in a, in a show, showcasing area, okay? Second stream, now people are no longer interested in just looking at the garment. They want to know, understand what the designer had in his mind when he created this uh, garment. They want to understand the whole story. They want to understand why the styling has been done like this. So there's something called second stream. So when you're watching the show live, there's a second window which opens, which gives you all that information about the model and the garment. Something called crowdsourcing, I'm sure all of you know, uh, which is about measuring the emotions and sentiments of the person who's watching. So for example, Topshop, when it is showcasing its show, it gets measured by 4 million people, it gets watched by 4 million people, and they monitor what people are taking snapshots of, and what are they sharing on social media. So they look for color patterns, they look for styles which are being shared. So that's how crowdsourcing gets done by the top brands. Conversation, okay. So live streaming is not only showcasing your content, it is also having a conversation with the person who is watching your show. For example, Tommy Hilfiger had 25 to 30 people conversing while his show was on, okay. So if while the Tommy Hilfiger show was on at New York Fashion Week and if you tweet to him that why is this model wearing this, what kind of look is this, while the show is on you will get a reply on Twitter saying this is why it has been done. So there is an active conversation which is happening while the action is there on the ramp. People are using data collection. So Mark Jacobs for example if you are watching their show online they, uh, they make sure that they collect your email and uh, your demographics because they call these people as their super fans because they will they are acting like influencers to the brand. So what I'm trying to say is social media is disrupting the fashion space completely. The front row of fashion is being redefined. Just to come to Lacme Fashion Week, this is our ecosystem. It's I'm not very happy with this. I think we have a lot of potential. But just to state few facts, we have 16,000 followers on Twitter, 2.8 lakh followers on Facebook. 2.4 lakh on Google Plus. Just to tell you, uh, our website got number of visits 55,000 in the month of August, whereas our event has about 10,000 people walking in during five days. 
So many more people are actually experiencing our event online than on ground. In terms of various portals, we had 1600 mentions during those five days. Our live feed was uh, seen 6000 times, okay? And for the first time, the Manish Malhotra show, we had uh, the online views were more than 1000, which was more than 600 people sitting there and watching. So that, that barrier was broken for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I'll now take you through a few observations, okay? And just to explain the points that I've raised. So, uh, Black May Fashion Week started with the Manish Malhotra show, which was scheduled at 9.30. But in the afternoon, Manish Malhotra did the first Google Hangout on fashion, okay, where he talked about the collection, okay. He talked about the entire thought process, he talked. So, he included and involved everyone in what he's going to showcase later in the night. Manish Malhotra opened the Black May Fashion Week, okay, 600 people and Bollywood presence was there. More than 1,000 people saw it online. Average time spent was 12 minutes. Let me tell you that the average time which people spend online on a video is about five minutes. So this time, is, so this timing is much better. For New York Fashion Week, it is about 15 minutes. For Australian Fashion Week, it's about 25 minutes. Uh, the collection went live as soon as the show got over. The collection went live on Pernia's pop-up shop immediately, and the customers could shop. Okay, so we had a tie with Pernia's pop-up shop where she was retailing uh, 10 of our designers directly off the ramp. I think it got sold out yeah, immediately it's... because I looked at that management at that. Yeah, uh, yes, I know few young younger designers did get sold out. I am not, I am, I don't have the data for Manish Malhotra's this yeah. but few younger designers certainly did get sold out. And a social wall at the event. Okay, I am sure all of you have heard of a Twitter wall, but now we are moving towards. Uh, social media aggregation wherein we are combining feeds from all the all the uh, from all the uh, social media vehicles uh, so a social wall was there at the event which was going live with both positive and negative reviews okay so it was there completely live now just imagine this scenario where there was a so there is this imagine this young girl from Guwahati okay who is obsessed with Manish Malhotra post the Chennai Express thing, half sari, she saw Deepika wearing half sari and she's influenced by Manish Malhotra, okay? And she wanted to watch the Manish Malhotra show and this is what drives the social media behavior. I'm sure everyone knows FOMO, fear of missing out, okay? So in the afternoon, she saw the Google Hangout, she knew what Manish is thinking about, she knew what he is going to showcase, then she saw the show, okay? Then she read about the opinions of various editors and uh, other bloggers on the social media wall and she was also empowered to buy the collection on Pernia's pop-up shop. So this is what, what we are trying to say that the actual front row was with this girl in Guwahati, you know, who had all the things available to her in her home, okay. So this is what we are trying to say. Now let me, uh, let, so one one is uh, taking a different view on front row, one is taking a straight view who are the people actually sitting in the front row at Lakme Fashion Week. So we are inclusive, we are collaborative, we have identified digital medium as a competitive advantage, so we have partnered with YouTube, okay. Now there are 17 media front rows that we have, allocation of a media uh, front row is a, I, I can tell you is a optimization exercise with a lot of variables like you know the reach of the publication, our relationship with that particular person, the power that person has or and the various markets that they reach out to. Okay. So it's a very complex exercise. You know you have 40 candidates and you can only give it to 17 of them. So we really had to fight it out to give one friend to Miss Malini. Okay. <laughs> so it was only because I appreciate <laughs> you know because see yeah, so that's who you bumped out. Everybody has to be skinnier so everyone can put those Also, stop my shut down. Who was the Yeah. 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 Literally speaking, I think there is still some time to go before, you know, the, the bloggers will have the influence or the number or the reach that they can be made to sit in the front row, but you know, obviously we are experimenting with Miss Marley. Uh, for, the first time, 
for the first time bloggers as a category was included in media okay we have category like newspaper magazines and tv and industry and freelancing and a blogger category was added and 50 bloggers were invited to the event and one young resource was made in charge of the social media strategy because I am clear that social media can only be handled by a young girl of 20, I mean she was 20 year old and she handled our entire strategy for social media. Now just to uh, pinpoint some observations on the media coverage, Bombay Times was only reporting about the Bollywood presence at Lakme Fashion Week, there was hardly any comment on the fashion that was being showcased on the ramp. And print media was also busy, you know, covering established designers, you know, like Sabya, Ritu Kumar, they hopped on the limelight. Uh, and obviously sponsors had their content in the print media. But social media was different. It was buzzing with a certain other set of designers, okay. So they were buzzing with designers like Salex and Nupu Kanoi and Nikhil Thampi and Nishka Lula, okay. So there was a complete difference in the coverage. And the, I, and I can confidently say that the social media coverage was much more holistic. Okay, they were covering fashion, they were covering relevant designers. Okay, they were covering street style, they were covering backstage. Okay, they were covering things in de great detail, whereas the print media had different set of objectives. So blogs were featuring excite, blog featured exciting pictures of guests. Okay, wearing their own uh, looks, exciting looks, backstage action. And another interesting thing was that Vogue.in was featuring the trends one day after the event where the Vogue magazine is going to come up with its Black and Fashion Week report in the month of December. Okay? Because they work with a 3 to 4 months of window. So do you think anything is anyone is interested in the Vogue December issue to look at Black and Fashion Week? I don't think anyone is waiting for that. So, so, just, so what I am trying to say is that yes, social media is playing an important role, it is disrupting, it is changing the values and a lot of things that have been happening in the fashion space, it is redefining the front row. Now what next, what can be done for Lackner Fashion Week, you know we are following the New York Fashion Week and Australian Fashion Week. So apart from the interactive live stream that I have talked about, we can, we are looking at content on demand which is a revenue sharing, you know, so we can look at revenue sharing from our content, we can start doing that. Fashion GPS where, you know, we start making online uh, guest lists, okay, you can RSVP online, we can we can start tracking all our samples, we can increase our PR exposure, so that can be done through Fashion GPS. There are social media lounges and cutting edge digital promotions which are being done. I did a QR code enabled treasure hunt, for example, at Lackner Fashion Week. So cutting edge promotions can be expected. People are moving on to fashion film, fashion films, okay, they are no longer interested in making their catalogs, uh, a hard copy of their catalogs or their TV films. Fashion films is a new buzzword which they start, which they premiere on, on let's say, uh, on a YouTube or other social media channels. So a lot of designers are also now uh, launching their ad campaigns on social media and one strategy that every fashion week is following is aggregation of social media because there are too many things which everyone is doing. So if there is a, if we can combine all the feed together, okay, so that one person can see what is happening on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, then it is extremely convenient, okay, for everyone. So that is what everyone is working on, and so that, so that sums up uh, my talk. And essentially, I have said three things. One is the social media is disrupting the space of fashion, we might move on to a digital fashion week, it is redefining the front row, the front row actually belongs to the person who is uh, looking at the live stream and it is democratizing the front row. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe now it is, I don't know, was it good enough? A juicy masala for a question and answer session, uh, that will follow. So with that, some um, you know we have two people. We have someone who sat in the front row this time also. But if you want to come up and tell us about your <laughs> your experience, um, Pearl also has slides. Okay, I, you, you don't have slides. You have slides. So Kaisha will go last because she has she's slide less. <laughs> Okay, so at the onset, thank you, Safir, for including me on the front row. That was really special. And I'll give you a little bit of a background. I used to be the fashion director of Marie Claire till one day the magazine shut down. And social media was fantastic because I found out I lost my job on Twitter. 
Um, but uh, anyway, so basically my presentation is a little bit fun. I want to infuse like while fashion is serious business. I think social media is also about having fun with fashion. It's about fashion in your everyday life. And this quote's been credited to Coco Chanel, but I'm not sure if I can verify that. But I think it's true of all the social media content that I'm following and I'm looking at bloggers like living their life. I think uh, fashion on social media isn't just about like covering it as a business or watching it as a fashion show, it's about living fashion every single day and documenting this fashionable life on Instagram and Twitter and you know all of these mediums. And I'm going to hit uh, in on the FOMO aspect as well that Sake talked about. I think fashion all these years, like with couture in the 40s and 50s, has thrived on fear of missing out. So everybody on the outside has always thought, oh my god, you know, like what was in there. But now, uh, I think all of that's changing and bloggers are changing this fear of missing out phenomena. Like you're part of this and bloggers are helping you feel like you're part of it. But uh, Ria, my colleague, and I were talking about it this afternoon when I was discussing my fear of missing out theory and she said to me that bloggers are also driving once again, you know, for the outside world, look, you know, we're in it and you're missing out. So they're documenting this fashionable life to show to the world that, you know, you're missing out on this amazing life. And so this for example, is a blogger I follow on Instagram very actively. She's called Song of Style, uh, Amy. She has a million followers, I think, if I'm getting the numbers right. Um, and she documents her everyday life. And when I mean by fashionable life, it's not just what she wears. It's the couch she's purchased. It's her house. And what I'm trying to say is if you're a potential blogger who's documenting your fashionable life, if you do it right, um, it can lead to this. And this is on Amy's um, blog. You know, you can get professional inquiries and advertising like Bombay Times. <laughs> and it can also lead to this. Like, Teen Vogue uh, featured her house and her wardrobe. And I thought that was really cool that a space that was reserved for celebrities or, you know, fashion influencers is now moving into the blogger's wardrobe, and why not? Um, and then I want to move into this other point, is about how fashion is, ve it's really driven by influencers, and like Saki touched upon before as well, the editor of Vogue and a blogger, you know, are equally important. So you have Anna Winter talking about Brian Boyd being Anna Del Russo, who's the fashion director of Vogue Japan's best friend. And I think this relationship is symbiotic. I don't think they can do without each other because Vogue needs bloggers in their magazine as content and the blogger needs Vogue to uh, give them this credibility because I still feel like a fashion journalist, you know, what makes them stand apart is the fact that there's some credibility behind what they're talking about. And, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so basically this is Anna Winter and Brian Boy. Uh, ten years ago this would have been unimaginable. But today, you know, they're hanging out together at the same store launch taking pictures. Um, and this uh, is advice for future bloggers. I think it helps to be friends with the editors as well. Um, this is a picture I dug out from Santu. I don't know if you're aware, but he has a very popular blog called The Devil Board. And this is like one of his first few posts from 2011 where he's photographed the front row and if you follow him now on Twitter he's you know got all these pictures with all of these people on the front row you know they're all friends now so I think this you know is really uh, symbolic um, so basically what I want to talk about is that now that we've identified who's influencing fashion at fashion week how how do they help brands? Like how are brands using these influencers to get you know the message across? I think they're using these four mediums: uh, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'm sure Malini Pandurad like tons of others, but I think these four are most popular uh, amongst the fashion set. 
is um, I think brands need to get creative with how they're using these influencers. And my favorite example of a fashion brand that's excellent on social media is Burberry. Uh, they're really, really thinking ahead all the time. And this exercise they did uh, was called the Art of the Trench. Um, as you all know, the trench coat is Burberry's most iconic uh, product. And they basically got this blogger from uh, New York who's again very huge and now he's working, I think, with GQ, the satirist, to document really influential street style, um, you know, people in the trench coat around the world. And then as an exercise, they got real people. So you could be sitting at your home looking at the Burberry website and you could send a picture of yourself in the trench coat and they would put that up. And then they got Manu who's in Bombay to also uh, document, you know, some influential Indians to put on the trench coat and that went up as well. So it became like this really amazing global exercise and I love that. Like as a global brand, how do you get out of Milan and reach out to the world? I think this is a great way they did it. And I think because they did this right, we got this data online where they got 50%, 57% uh, share of Twitter feedback uh, on Atlantic Fashion Week because they're so active on social media. And okay. oh, and brands uh, also using video. That's how I showed this Dior commercial that's gone up on YouTube yours reaching out to all of its consumers. Uh, this is the first, again, very recent, only in July. Uh, for the very first time in the world, Oscar de la Renta broke their uh, campaign on Instagram. So it wasn't in the September issue of Vogue. Um, it was on Instagram in July, and Oscar PR Girls, this very influential, Erica is their PR uh, head of communications. And she's become this amazing face of this brand that was Fadi Dadi and has turned it around on Twitter. And like, you know, first look on Instagram and 6,000 views, amazing. You know, I think it's a great way to reach out to the younger audience and it's real time. And um, this is an excerpt from Roberto Cavalli's blog. I think social media also helps people who are, uh, you know, larger than life. Like say somebody like a Giorgio Armani or Roberto Cavalli, you know these are people with fantastic lifestyles. They have they're probably as popular as Brad Pitt, you know, to the super fans as you may call them. And this is really sweet and it's intimate. And he's telling people, you know, share your problems with me, and I'll talk about my problems with you. And you know, we'll try and save the world while we're still influencing fashion and still buying a fur coat. You know, like it's just really sweet. Um, and this I thought was really fun as well. This is an amazing tweet and while you might not think it's really important, it started, it kicked off a major uh, fashion controversy because Jordan Dunn is this supermodel, um, this black girl who went to audition for Dior and basically tweeted live and said I just got cancelled from Dior, she's like, got wrong. But <laughs> and suddenly, um, you know, the tabloids picked it up. Grazia picked it up and suddenly it was this big story about anorexia all over again. Are we, you know, focusing on skinny girls? And it was not like sources said or he said, she said, it was direct from the source. So I think it's also helping people create dialogue and bring forward issues straight from, you know, the horses. And in India, I mean, okay, now after seeing these presentations, maybe not, but I think personally the brand still have, like, could do so much more. Like, there is so much potential and there's like a billion of us, so you could be doing so much more. Yes, but making buzz, uh, because we're talking about social media and front row, I thought high heel is relevant because their tagline is front row tal kalagake, and they're like bringing Bollywood to you in seconds. And before you say old news, this is new stuff people are doing. I thought the Fashion Week wall was really, really cool. Um, including while you were at Fashion Week, you're walking around the lounges and you can see live tweets. I remember two years ago, I was at the Dolce Gabbana show in Milan, and that was the first, because while we were watching the shows, um, the background walls were like live tweets, and they'd given everybody a hashtag, and I thought that was really cool and interactive. So similarly, I think this is fantastic, because it's real time 
social um, connections. And then uh, Ms. Malini is another influencer that brands are using to reach out to a larger audience. And contests, I think, are really, really helping um, people get involved and there's incentive to then look up the brand and, and it's incentive for brands as well to connect with an audience. And, uh, okay, let's talk about street style. It's like everybody's talking about street style and for some reason in India as well, street style is really picked up and a lot of bloggers are focusing on street style. So, so one of the blogs uh, is The Devil War. Uh, they just, I'm sorry I wasn't able to do full on screen graphs. Um, there's, this is Manu and he documented this at Lakme Fashion Week where he asked all the girls a question of what you had to wear at Fashion Week and then also documented their look there. And this is East Irista and a large, I met them two weeks ago and a large part of their um, strategy is also to focus on street style and real people style. Um, which is why we didn't want to be left behind. Uh, so last week, actually just over this, what was it, Tuesday? Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. When Miss Malini and Style Cracker uh, created this whole Bombay Street Style project, we wanted to participate as stylists, and so we styled um, our muse, Amrita Puri, on the left for the Street Style project. And what was really interesting was the number of people who came up to me and were like, What is street style? And Amrita said to me as well, Are you sure this look is street style? Because so there is no real definition of street style, like, I think it's subjective and personally to me street style is anybody who's looking great at any time and whoever takes a picture, I mean that's street style, so it could be anything you're wearing, I don't think there is a correct definition but it, it's up to you, what you define as street style. Um, now I want to go back to how like I wanted this presentation to be very personal and about how I use social media. So I gave you like a little overview on like fashion globally. But this is how I use social media for myself and my work. So like you'll know I used to be with Marie Claire. And while I was with the magazine, I uh, a lot of photographers use this website called Behance that I got onto. And it's a great, if you're a creative professional, copywriter, graphic designer, artist, stylist, designer, anything. Use it, it's a great way, um, very easily accessible site to upload your thumbnails onto Behance. And this is what I was using and it was great for me to interact with other creative professionals. I got job bookings off this site. You know, people were contacting me and saying, well, work with you, retouchers, etc. So this is how I started my career with social media. <laughs> and then this is a flashback to the things we did at Marigold India and the lessons I learned while I was at the magazine and trying to organize uh, content. We realized early on that YouTube videos and like people love videos and they love Bollywood. So we decided to do behind the scenes of all our cover shoots and put it up on Facebook. And those uh, posts got maximum hits compared to any other posts that we put up. And on Twitter as well, we realized early on that it was a great way to interact with like designers, readers, get instant feedback. So we've got Nishka saying, you know, her skirt was featured in the magazine. Or we've got, you know, somebody saying, my friend was featured, I really like Kalol's outfits. Or we have a writer from the magazine saying, please read my story. So it was a really great way to bring a lot of people on board and getting their views real time. And finally, this is how it works for me now. So I've basically started my own styling studio. It's called the Percha Styling Studio. And I wanted to take you all through my um, process on how I decided to promote this. So basically news broke on Twitter that the magazine's shutting down and blah, blah, blah. And then I decided the only way, and there was so much rumors going on all around. So I thought the only way I could get things right is probably put up a quote on you know, Twitter, it's only had to reach out to people. And then, you know, I had all these like really sweet like messages from everyone, including mm -hmm. me. And, but then it didn't stop me. So what I did is, so on one hand, on the same day that I announced my resignation, because I had another shoot in hand, and I didn't want people to think, oh God, you know, like, we feel so sorry for her. You know. I had a campaign. So instantly it was up there. I'm shooting from Italy. So, you know, there was, this like sudden support, everyone was really excited and happy for me. And then I realized early on that 
this is a great way for me to share my work and to tell people out there that, hey, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still around. I'm still available for bookings. So I use Twitter and Instagram to put up images of my work and everything that I was doing. And so, you know, I put up a picture from Maybelline's campaign or like behind the scenes from a clean and clear campaign shoes I styled. And I'm selling a Bollywood star called Pallavi Sharda, who's doing this movie called Besharam. And then we started an act autumn winter presentation. So there was like lots we were doing, and this was the only way we could get word out then. And which is why uh, when I finally decided to launch my own uh, styling studio, I used Instagram like Oscar uh, to announce uh, the launch, you know. And like we had lots of support and lots of hits, and it's the maximum number of like likes I've ever had on a post. I was really, really touched. And again, uh, Miss Malini works for me because, you know, the minute I style a Bollywood star, Yasmin uh, on her team puts it up and then there's a credit, a little credit that goes out to me. So designers know I'm doing this and then I'm more than happy to send me more looks. Um, you know, our fashion circle, again, real time feedback. Like somebody said, oh, we love her styling and it made me really happy because on one hand, a blogger put it up and then it was on Twitter five minutes later and there was a credit, so it was fantastic. And then we, because of all this Facebook and Instagram coverage, we were picked up by a popular blog called Brown Paper Pack, who noticed we, we started out on our own. And we didn't have to reach out to anybody, they called us. So it was really amazing that, you know, one day into launching the studio, the next day we were on Brown Paper Pack and we got a lot of queries. Thanks to that. Um, but my <coughs> provocation for this talk, like while I end, because this is just the beginning of a journey for us on social media, and we're going to be using it very, very actively, um, is that this is Susie Menkes. She's uh, the fashion editor for International Herald Tribune and probably one of the most powerful uh, <coughs> names in the fashion world. And uh, her job brief changed. So her job was only to instantly send in reviews, which would then appear in the newspaper the next day. But now she's required, so you see her with her iPhone plugged into the laptop, like really multitasking. And so if the journalist is doing what the blogger does, is the blogger still as relevant as the journalist? Because now the journalist is taking over the blogger's job. Like earlier the blogger, you know, everyone, there was this big buzz, I remember when I was studying journalism about how bloggers were taking away fashion jobs. But now you have the journalist trained to do what the blogger does. So you know who's winning. That's my provocation for today. Thank you. Thank you. So she did your job. I didn't about your journey. Okay, please. I don't have a slide. You can have a, you can get a hand up. Is it not? Just after the time. Okay, very good. It's my pleasure to have that. So I want to ask you, tell me about your journey. Tell me about how you began, um, you know, from someone who's not in the fashion world and not a complete outsider. Okay. And your journey is how you used, in a sense, uh, you know, your blog and everything else to get you into Fashion Week and all now as a fashion insider. Tell us about that very personal journey. And then maybe you can respond to her a provocation about you know. Um actually I also write I'm also a journalist. Yes. So Okay. Um uh, before I start I should actually tell everyone public speaking is not my thing. I'd rather just stop on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Um but um I actually started my blog in two thousand nine, which would pretty much be the first set of fashion blogs in um in in the country. So um, when I started, um, so everyone, you know, I mean, there was regular blogging, you know, put up emo poems and things like that. But um, and I happened to come across this blog called Style in the City, Paris, which um, and at, back then I wasn't familiar with the concept of street style. So um, it was wow, like I'm sitting here in in front of my computer screen in Bombay, looking at all of these gorgeous people and. I think literally for one week I just went through all the archives and I started picking up what other people were doing and um, I didn't have a camera. I had um, 
Uh, I used the Nokia 2 megapixel camera and I said, okay, you know, this is what I want to do when I'm still in college. And I start taking people in the train and things like that. And people think it's crazy. But I think, um, so that's how it started primarily as a street style blog. And um, to take me really horrid pictures to like kind of, I think it's, it's been more of a, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk in terms of followers and things like that, but it's more of a self journey like I learned how to sort of, what I want to do with this space. So, um, what else I can do with, when you start reading and there's so many things, like something as simple as DIY or, you know, and then there were personal style blogs. I kind of took things from, you know, interesting aspects and now kind of try to put together something more roots and, you know, and like off late I've been trying to um, visit stores and, you know, off beat sort of, um, like, like I went to Delhi and I, um, got in touch with Lovebirds. Yeah, I'm on River. And then there's this, uh, uh, there's this talk of living out in Pondicherry, which that's only if that. So, you know, maybe things like that, spaces. And so, um, yeah. And so I think what is your role then in this whole fashion ecosystem? What role do you see, say, a purple people playing in this um, ecosystem? When there are experts who are right from the right. league to, you know, a, a I think because there are so many bloggers, I think everyone's trying to say something, but I think a lot of people are just saying things for the sake of saying things. So I think it's very important. You know, you don't always, you don't have to do it after every show. Maybe you like it. Maybe something really, as you said, something really complicated. You know, say it then. Don't just say it because you're here and you have a space to talk. So I think the point is, um, if you really <coughs> have to sustain yourself, um, say things that actually matter. So you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you're a blog. You don't always have to churn out a 500 piece article and put it out there. So you know, I mean, something something simple like, for example, um, knuckle rings. So everyone here knows because everyone here talks fashion, but if I had to tell someone on the street what a knuckle ring is, why is something like that? many people know what a knuckle ring is. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, so in know. that sense... They don't know, they don't know. So in that yeah. sense, if I had to put a... Is it I will show you pictures? Is it her blog? I <laughs> So the point is, so sometimes just putting a picture there, tells you everything, but at, at the same time, there has to be some depth. You can't always just put an Instagram picture and expect it to. So I, I think, so personally speaking, I try to make it relevant, try to, you know, not just be at the surface. It's like he said, it's not just about the show, it's not just about the garments, but maybe there's a story. So, and, and sometimes when you get talking and you'll be surprised that you didn't even think of it like that. So I think that's pretty much what it is about, it's about what I find that very interesting because most <clears throat> most people think of social media as something which is about you know the instantaneous. And what I'm finding is, in fact, you're saying the opposite. You're actually using social media for slowness, for depth, for uh, for in a sense for that kind of slow curation. So I think that's a wonderful actually way to you know open this up for discussion to with the others. Have you all, have you all found that as well? I mean. Are these misconceptions of social media? I'm just going to sit like here and whatever. Do you all think of these misconceptions of social media as something which is about the past, the image, not the health, hot dog? I mean, this is not um, so, I mean, what, I want to get to that, but I want to answer Pearl's question because it was such a great question about how the. Yeah. Check. See, yeah. this is online. Yeah. I wouldn't have had this problem. Yeah. Um, just kidding. Now, I wanted to answer Pearl's question because such a great question about how magazine editors are now tweeting and Instagramming and doing that. Yeah. And my response to that is that that's fabulous because that actually expands my world. Because if I was the only blogger in a world full, I would just be this crazy geek, right? But the fact that magazine editors are now seeing the value of sitting front row and tweeting and Instagramming just makes what I do more valuable. And I think that because as a magazine editor, you might spend some time tweeting, taking pictures, but you're still thinking about the well thought out, glossy magazine story, we'll always tell different stories, but ones that sort of complement each other. And I think online, because there's so much multimedia, and there's pictures and video and that extended version of it, it's almost like the magazine is you know, the front of the show, like the, the theater performance, and the blog is the behind the scenes and the rehearsal and all of that. 
So it's it's what you may have uh, a limitation on your a number of pages. That landscape is so much bigger online that you're able to do that. You know, and I, I think that's fabulous. And, and to answer your question, I think that people use it in different ways. I think that the consumer wants instant um, pictures and and you know videos and all of that. But we forget that the consumer is also making up their own mind. You may be telling them something, but not every consumer is going to sit and say, yes, I agree with you. They just really just want access. Like you said, your girl who's sitting in Gohati, she wants to see the show and make up her own mind about it. So I think that there can be two kinds. You can take the slow route and think about what you post, if that's the opinion kind of blog you're doing. But if you're providing news, you're just posting up the content. And that's also good. So I think I think social media for me personally is more about relevance to me as an individual, okay, and about quality also. And just to give you an example, I think a week back I saw that, uh, for example, I was following Amitabh Bachchan on Twitter, okay, and I saw his tweets were becoming too much of himself, so I unfollowed him, you know. So, so even if it is Amitabh Bachchan and if he's, if there's no quality in his tweet, you know, people are not going to follow him just because he's Amitabh Bachchan. So we are looking, we as followers are looking for relevance, we are looking for quality, okay? We are looking for some information which is, which matters to us, okay? So I think that is extremely important. And then once that relevance happens, what's interesting is then that Akarishma also from almost an outsider position can come and become a fashion insider because you work very differently, you've been reporting from that. And to me that's very interesting because that relevance kind of serves as that crowd-sourced kind of cloud score in that sense of pushing you up. Uh, what about authenticity in that case? Because then if we have, why do people spend years in becoming an insider if you can then go through this process of, you know, just bubbling up because of popularity? Is there any yeah. space in this world for authentic, trained, that, that, that was actually part of my question. If you have a Susie Menkes who spent like maybe 40 but years. But Susie Menkes is a very participant. She didn't look very happy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I have been more questions. audience, yeah. like I, I think personally, there is space like money set for all kinds. So on one hand, you have something like a border and falls, which is like a really beautifully curated, well-designed thought space. So there is place for that, and you have readers who want to go to that, but sometimes I want to put gossip and I go to Miss Malini. And sometimes I want to like, you know, slow well thought of peek into somebody's wardrobe and I go to Water and Fall. So I think you have there those, is you enough have it's like a magazine rack or like a newspaper rack out there and you can choose what you want. Yeah. Like it's all out there. And then as a consumer you have a choice to do whatever you feel like. I think there's space think, for everybody. And I think exactly like, like I love that Pro used the example of you know the contest we're doing because I think that for me, I mean personally the blog is really about extending and making things accessible to the audience. Now you may not normally and I think the average person may be afraid to go into a Venetian or a store and try on the jewelry. It's a little intimidating because you walk in maybe thinking I should look a certain part. But it's sort of like what I like to say is that look I didn't know a ton about fashion but I'm learning about it now and I'm going to these shows and understanding what's happening. And you can come with me on this journey. I'll give you an example which I gave recently as well. I, I mean, I'll admit this now, don't tell me about it. I don't really shop online because I'm intimidated by it. I'm scared about the whole process. And you know, how do you return stuff and how will it fit? So I said, you know what, I'm sure everyone has this question. So why don't I do a video series documenting me actually doing this? So I started doing this and I try on the clothes and I'm like, these pants didn't fit twice. So what am I doing wrong? And I think that's also helping the audience where they might feel with the magazine that they're talking or reading someone who's so far evolved from them that they might feel stupid asking the question. And I, I ask a stupid question on, the, on their behalf. So You find that as well when you dress up because you... Do you find that as well for your... when you post pictures of yourself wearing stuff, you find in terms of the response your readers connect with you in that sense? Yeah, I think it's basically breaking down things so when somebody who's not a part of fashion sees it on the run they don't you know there are a lot of elements and they need someone to kind of break it down and tell them how to do it so I think it, it is actually it's, it's slightly flattering because I've had a few people send me pictures of stuff that they've seen and kind of you know worked it on that they saw on my blog not necessarily me but you know something that they saw on my blog it's like okay so then I'm getting so you're adding value to, to yeah. their lives and that's, like not, and that's not another thing as well, is fashion, I mean, not that there's anything. Oh, hello, did you find out about us on social media? Just, <laughs> and then you rest here. That's another thing, is there, can we use 
you know, now it's fashion and social media. Other examples that you've come across where we can use this to, as presumptuous as it sounds, create a better world. Are there any interesting examples yeah. or exemplars that you've come across if you wanna, uh, if you wanna tell us? So yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example that. So I'll give you an example that I thought was really interesting and, and this is what makes me love my India so much is that internationally I find that most people want to see their celebrities stripped of makeup and having wardrobe malfunctions. But one example for me personally was that I once put up a picture of Rajnikanth without his hair and makeup and I got slammed for it and they said like he's a god and like how could you do this and literally I, re I put, took the post down, I had 82 people slamming, flaming me for it and I said I'm really sorry I did that. And I realized that, you know, for us, the, the fashion and the Bollywood, the, all the content is an extension of that three-hour escape in that movie. And that made me feel really good about us, you know? I was like, maybe we're better people than other people are all around the world, you know? Saving the world through beauty and fashion. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a crazy world. I think this is a good time. And I have, again, I literally have hundreds of questions, but um, you all have been extreme. You have, you have a question already. Very good. So why don't I bring you one mic and then we like rush through the other mics. Again, remember everyone after this, we have like chic kebabs downstairs, like chic kebabs. Get it? We worked really hard on getting that. And um, you know, we thought you all since you're such fashion veterans, you must, you must be bored of like caviar and dom. So we dropped all that. Instead we're doing fabulous roof stuff. After this, so we like, we'll have some questions and we go down for snacks so you can chat with them as well. I know you might have to rush. Um, but you know, every, okay, everyone else is going to be there. Can we do this? Can I take like questions in bunches of threes and fours and then we answer them? I don't know whether this is a question or a comment. Uh, but is Paris uh, losing the deep as the mecca of fashion when uh, uh, social media invading the fashion world and globalizing it? That's a lovely question. You have one more? So one, Okay, and then you have. This could be probably an extension to the same question. Has it also happened the other way around? I'm a very layman to fashion. I don't know what is fashion. And I've never followed much. But I have you a collection of. Well, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a collection of uh, some 1970s and uh, 80s fashion magazines in my uh, closet. It's just kept there. I open it sometimes and what. Has it happened that after this social media and even maybe before that, People who are not really designers, who are not really, as he said, who are outsiders to fashion, have they come into the inside world of fashion as designers? I mean, if to, tomorrow I put my own picture, I'm just a common man, I put my own picture, but then there's somebody who's saying, yeah, his baggies look wonderful, why not put them in a show? And has this has happened something happens that happens. some yeah. corner has come inside and then... Maybe you should answer that. Okay. Maybe I should answer that because you gave me an example today about how Instagram is in and then I want you to answer the Paris as the center of the world question yeah. as well. I think you can talk to the mic. No. Okay, with the mic. No, I mean, I was having this conversation with Pearl this afternoon, and because um, I read this article about Instagram and how, you know, it's the new social media. And um, uh, basically, a lot of designers, what they're doing is they have a whole bunch of followers, and they're looking at their followers' feed because most of the time our inspiration is very visual. So they're looking at what their followers are taking pictures of. So they might say, if she's a follower of mine, and she takes a picture of, say, you know, the stable, and she says, oh, I love it for this or this reason, as a designer, I would say, okay, that looks cool to me, and maybe incorporate it in my next collection. And so I'm literally giving back to my follower what she likes. So it's kind of like a circle. Another way of looking at it could be she could say she took my idea, and then she yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's another <laughs> But, you know, I mean, that's how they're all connecting and, you know... Anu Malik says that every time. <laughs> <laughs> he listens to a beautiful English song. So, I mean, I think um, that's what we thought was really interesting and cool, you know. But, okay. Um, you want to answer the Paris yeah. center of the world question? I think... Um, I think fashion, like, I keep saying, social media start making fashion a global place. So, I don't think it's about Paris or Milan or London or Mumbai or... New York or Shanghai, I think the whole idea is for brands and especially, I mean, global brands like your Burberry's and Dior's, it's a great way to reach the world. And, uh, you know, you have uh, fashion forecast, I think WGSN, and they've been doing this for five or six years now. 
because they actually there's somebody and it's an amazing job i think their job is to literally travel around the world like including sao paulo or rio or dublin and take pictures of shop windows there's a person who gets paid to do that to understand global fashion so and then that in turn could influence you know because it's a fashion forecast site so shop window in dublin is influencing somebody in shanghai so i think it's it's really really global and that's what social media is going to our world now and it's not just fashion it's in terms of center yeah. periphery breakdowns that happens everywhere so maybe yeah. also uh, so with uh, fast fashion brands like zara and mango entering india i think india is now not lagging behind europe as it used to do earlier where it was said that you know fashion in india comes one year after europe so now we men in india are wearing as many color pants as they are wearing in europe so we are now uh, in sync with europe in terms of global fashion thanks to all these fast fashion brands uh, coming in and getting uh, that to the indian consumers also indian consumers are they i think in the last 2 to 3 years they have started getting educated on all these things okay and how to exercise themselves how to uh, see the overall look rather than just buy a shirt and a trouser and it is all happening thanks to the fast fashion brands coming in the social media people focusing on street style and sharing all this relevant information with all of them so indian consumers are evolving so is the indian me indian fashion media also evolving If you ask me that who is Indian fashion media, I don't have more than twenty names. Okay, two, three of them are sitting here, for example. So there are not too many people in the Indian media space who understand fashion or who have been covering fashion. Okay, and if you leave out the Bollywood part, there will be hardly ten people who actually comment on the fashion which is there in India. So the Indian fashion media is evolving. Vogue has just entered, I think, in two thousand seven. Okay, um, there are not too many fashion supplements that we have. so with all this i think uh, uh, we are seeing a lot of change in last 2 to 3 years for example dress as a category for women didn't exist let's say 3 years back but now you see everyone has dress every indian women has dress as a you know as part of a wardrobe so we are discovering new categories we are discovering new fashion trends we are discussing the overall stylized look we are we have started reading the lifestyle magazines okay thanks to the media thanks to the fast fashion brands thanks to social media so so in india we are seeing a complete overhaul of media also of consumers also both ways so it's working both ways that's very good i just like to add something and i also think you know because we all look at it as so seriously and i think that social media is teaching us not to take ourselves so seriously and fashion and that sort of like you said it's breaking those barriers where people can be like well you know i don't know anything about it but now it's not such a, like i don't have to worry so much and, and i think that's the key right that fashion i mean at the end of the day we're i mean some fashion people is going to kill me for saying this is literally we're covering our bodies with clothes and having fun with it right and i think we need to remember that and social media reminds us so now i have a question for you as a as a follow up to that on something that sakit said which is about the intersection of our, our fashion and body would you yourself said that you know covering bollywood was a huge spurt for you but i'm just wondering if from a fashion sense is it a blessing or a curse because uh you know with this fixation on bollywood are we doing fashion as service or a disservice and if you know uh, i may yeah. be you all as well because you all i don't know you touch about bollywood so much but there's a big influence by it. I think one I mean one at the end of the day I'm catering to my audience my audience wants to see the bollywood celebrity and I think that it's interesting that bollywood is also becoming more educated about fashion so why not as opposed to having a model that may not have as much reach have a bollywood celebrity wearing the styles and be educated and aware about it and it's an example that I, I when I used to do radio I used to start bringing like a Rahul Khanna or you know Imran Khan to my radio station to play their 20 favorite english songs why did I do that because i felt like enough people didn't or understand english music or listen to it but because they love imran khan they'll listen and they'll be educated about something new and bollywood celebrities have the opportunity to again reach an audience that was probably uninterested unaware uneducated because they love the celebrity and i don't think there's anything wrong with that okay so i come from magazine background fashion yeah fashion and bollywood so i have two sides of the story now Um, when I was in a magazine, I was always disappointed because I love my models. I love how they look on a magazine cover. My favorite magazine covers have always been with models. But like whether I was with Vogue, so I started with Vogue and then uh, with Marie Claire, 
it was like numbers said it, you know. So it was it. Like the advertising team or the circulation team sat down with you, and the numbers said it for you. So you had a Sonam selling ten times more copies than uh, Lakshmi, you know. Even though it, like it's like a fashion person always is like, whoa, I love my models. You know, it, the figures say a different story. And now that I've started out on my own. It's not so much, so while I've done like some fashion campaigns and all of that, it's Bollywood that's actually reached out to me, you know, instead of the fashion magazine world. So if it's there and there's an opportunity, like why not, like let's not ignore them, like they exist, no, they're a large no, no, part. No, yeah, come over to the dark side. Yeah, yeah. Move over, <laughs> send my soul to the devil. Kanishma, <laughs> what about you? As you're becoming more and more popular, is it hard to stay? independent and fiercely independent, are you being seduced, whether by commerce, whether by Bollywood, by all these things? But how would I be influenced by them? I don't think it's a use either to feature them or... Oh, uh, yeah, no, I no. promise, no. Okay. <laughs> but, um, commerce definitely. That Tell us about that, then. Um, well, you have pretty much every e-commerce site writing to you and, you know, I'm going to send a bag over and, you know, I'm going to send a pair of keys over. But, I think the point is there has to be some sort of process of curation. So, um, I think like a lot of bloggers make deals with certain brands that you know maybe look into me a certain amount of money or vouchers or you know whatever. But I think the point is it's okay to do it, but don't spend money. Just and magazines have been doing that for years, and they call it like yeah. the marketing. Integrate <laughs> Oh, no, so it's the same, right? So I'm saying, why should yeah. it be different? I'm so glad you said that because I think that, and honestly, I'm, I'm glad to be able to bring this up. I think that bloggers get a bad rap because suddenly you have no integrity or you're selling out. Yeah. But if you look at a glossy or a newspaper, there are commercials everywhere. And there's two sides, yeah. not the edit team, there's the marketing yeah. team, does there's the same thing. So yeah. I'm just wondering. Why. So I think I think that the fair point to say is that if if a blogger is you know, a brand gives you money and you say, oh, I love this brand. And then tomorrow another brand you say, oh, I love this brand. Then you don't sound real. And I think that's your journey and your relationship with your reader. And the only reason people will read my blog is if they really trust me. Otherwise, if I say I love everything all the day long, they'll just say you're just like an insane, happy person and you don't trust your judgment. But I think it's important that you build that relationship. And then I expect that if I have that relationship, that the brands come to me because they trust that I will not compromise that. And that that's why they're coming to me because I have that relationship. But it works in different ways, and I and I understand the fear and the like. Well, how dare you take money for this? I'm like, well, how am I going to do this for a living? I mean, I'm not a rich kid, so no, I do have to pay my rent. My next thing is globally, people have built media empires using only social media, whether it's the Gawker Group, whether it's so many others. In fact, Jay Pensky, who built his whole media thing using social media, just bought variety. Which is interesting because you know they built a social media empire and now they are buying these old, you know, you know, print media publications. So I was wondering when will you have that kind of social media business empire? I'm working on it. <laughs> um, you know, what are the contours? What will it take? What will it take to make money using you know social media and beyond fashion and lifestyle as these two things? Sakir, if you wanna. I I just want to uh, answer on the Bollywood thing because yeah. people call my fashion week as a Bollywood fashion week. So I'm very extremely touchy you about it. other fashion <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me tell you uh, that you know Bollywood is now. I hate calling it Bollywood. It's Indian cinema is now 2,400 crores. Okay, the Hindi cinema in every year. Okay, and a lot of money now has started penetrating into fashion. Also, if you look at the Beshara ad that is coming in the paper, it clearly mentions that the costume styling has been done by Kunal Rawal. Okay, I'm sure all of you know that uh, Chennai Express was by Manish Malhotra, Yajavani Adivani was by Manish Malhotra, Ram Leela is by Anju Modi. You know, Mary Kom is going to be by Rajat Kamli. So Bollywood is you know is putting in a lot of money in fashion also bollywood is becoming fashionable now if you look at the reach of bollywood in india you know it cannot be compared with anything okay so we were talking about the dior video which have let's say how many million views and the you know the krish free trailer has got let's say 12 million views let's say in two or three days okay so if we have to penetrate the fashion into tier 2 and 3 cities, okay, I think right now it can only be done through Bollywood. We need to make our Bollywood much more stylish, okay, 
and that is the only way where I see the fashion can be, uh, you know, carried to a person on the street. Okay, social media obviously is doing it. It is only, I mean, it has its limited reach. But I see Bollywood as a large driver which will give a lot of revenue to the Indian designers also and will also take Indian fashion to the tier 2 and 3 towns also. There's actually a really interesting thing happening today because it's Yash Chopra's birthday. They're launching a line called Diva Ni, like Diva and apostrophe and I. And it's a women's sari brand that, like Karol Park saris, I believe, that's tied up to create a whole line of Bollywood inspired saris. And that's genius, I think, because pretty much everybody wants to look like Madhuri Dixit in, or Sri Devi in her blue sari from whatever. Other questions? Because then we'll have, oh my god, there's so many. So wait, we took that side. Give me one of your minds. We'll come this side and then we'll come back to you that side. And we'll do this for maybe five more minutes and then we'll go like attack them over sheet kebabs and work there later. So the average time of some video someone said is five minutes. This video is going to be like one hour 45 minutes. <laughs> so basically my point is when blogging and Instagram Twitter started it was very personal because people who were following you were your friends and it's always said that don't mix your personal and professional lives but on social media it's pretty jumbled up so if you are like posting photos like for Pearl when you start your studio you're posting up fashion pictures but also sometimes you want to post like a really silly picture of yourself or your friends and then you think so what are your followers going to think about it? So how do you like sort of balance that out? Yes, sir. I use Facebook for all my personal stuff. Um, yeah. um, Actually, I want each of you to answer that because it's important. Yeah. Okay, so the way I distinguish it is that I don't, um, Facebook allows me different barriers of privacy. So my like inner circle friends can see everything. And then I have like these, you know, work friends that can see like part of my life. And then I have like these people I don't know, but I sort of know who can see nothing. So, <laughs> or like things like my shoots and stuff that I open up to public. Um, so that's how I treat it because Facebook allows me to set different levels of privacy. Instagram, I'm using purely for work. And in a weird way, I'm trying to portray my fashionable life because I believe that that's part of my image building exercise. So if I'm going sourcing, or if I'm getting a cup of Starbucks between sourcing, or if I'm like hanging out, you know, at this event with Amrita Puri that I've styled. So that all of that's going on Instagram. If there's a picture of just Amrita Puri, that's going only on Instagram. This picture of her and me together, and it's cute and it's fun. That's also being shared on Facebook. So I'm using Twitter and Instagram for work, Facebook for personal use, and then Facebook for work is open to public. Nobody uses email, it seems. Tell me about how you make the distinction between public and private. Um, again, as she said, Facebook is for friends. But um, at the same time, I think because it's a personal blog, once you put it up there, I think people who know you are even more curious. So it kind of always, putting it up on Facebook always pushes traffic to the blog. But um, otherwise, on Twitter, um, I don't need as public details. I won't tell my yeah. handle out loud. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so the thing is, it's you try not to take it so seriously. So you do put up stuff that you, you know, opinions and stuff that you blogged about or you know stuff that you've written. But it's still fun. Like don't take it so seriously. So I'll just say whatever I want to, even if it's maybe slightly funny or slight, slightly offensive. So. I think for me it's a little different because I mean my blog is called MissMalady.com so I started out really documenting my life and, and it became about Bollywood fashion because that was my experience and again so I have two Facebook accounts I have a public Miss Malady page and I finally figured out how to move my followers from my personal page to the public page if anyone needs help doing that let me know um, and then I use Instagram and Pinterest and I think I have different conversations but what I feel is that, and I, the reason why I think my Twitter followers have gone up so high is because I try to talk about the things that are relevant across, across different uh, categories. So I don't only talk Bollywood or only fashion. I watch Big Boss and I'm obsessed with making fun of Big Boss because it's one of those love-hate relationships with the show. So I tweet about that and that gets traction. And I think you have to decide early on how much you want to expose your life. And my husband decided when he married me that he's going to be totally fine with his pictures being posted all over them. They're like, you're that guy. 
Um, so I think it's also like you said, don't take it too seriously. And then obviously if it's something super personal or like when it's my personal friends and we go out drinking, I won't make that public because that's not fair to them. So that'll be in my personal Facebook, but celebrities are fair game. So if I see them <laughs> drinking, the picture will go up. Uh, no, but I mean, jokes aside, it really is, for me, it's, it's sort of a combination of both things. And you have to use your individual grown up discretion on what you make public. I think Facebook is about your school and college friends, okay, and what are they doing, how many kids they have, about your ex-girlfriends stalking them, what are they doing now. And, and Twitter is about, I think what she said is we need not be so serious about Twitter, because if we get serious then we can't tweet anything. For me, Twitter is about me as an individual. Okay, I have various roles to play, that of a husband, of a father, of a black man fashion week. So various roles, individual opinions. But I try not to give gyan on Twitter and it's all about what I'm feeling at that point of time. Very cool. I thought everything says WhatsApp. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Ms. Ankit. So I have two questions basically. Social media has sometimes got a lot of surprises for you, so you just don't know and things go well. So have you ever tried to make sense of those things and what were your insights? And secondly, uh, other than surprises, sometimes things go out of hand. So e-commerce websites but get a lot of customer complaints on their Facebook pages and then compliments. So have, have you ever experienced that and how have you tackled it? So I, this is pretty much my daily life. Yeah. Um, so there is one thing that I mean, you never really know what's going to go super viral, but of late, and I'll tell you the secret, I don't know if you guys go to a website called BuzzFeed, but I love it, because they have these hilarious random gifs, and they'll make up a story about anything, like 20 ways Bollywood has you know, ruined your love life, or things like that, you know, and I think those really work. So um, we've realized that things that go viral, they're a little funnier, edgy, and not just reporting just the pictures of who came to which event, so we found that. On the, op on the opposite side, with celebrities I've found, they can very quickly get good publicity or negative publicity. An example is, a couple of years ago, Vipasha Basu tweeted a picture of herself, just her legs, and two girls tying her shoelaces. Now, she got really flamed for child labor. What actually happened is that her jeans were so tight, she couldn't tie her shoelaces, so her cousin sisters were helping her tie. So it's about zooming out and telling the whole story. So she then explained it and said, I realized why that was you know, communicated and, and must have looked bad. Uh, similarly, Tushar Kapoor decided to post like John Abraham one day, uh, wearing that, you know, the, it became the butt of all jokes, no pun intended. But you know, sometimes it can go the wrong way, you know? So I think you have, it's a little bit trial and error. Again, as a celebrity on Twitter, and I think all like Priyanka Chopra, Shah Rukh, they've all learned and become offended and left Twitter and come back and said, okay, we have to calm down and realize not to take it so seriously. But the things that I've noticed without fail that go viral are things that, uh, people can relate to, funny lists because people don't have a lot of patience to read a thousand words online uh, and uh, just uh, obviously video, GIF animations, things that are visually appealing and something that has a take on it that nobody else has. Those are the things that go viral. Does anyone else want to add or we have one? That, okay, that's going to be the last question. Right? So better be like deep and meaningful. Yeah, there are two questions. Yeah. Uh, oh, there are two questions. Yeah. <laughs> so one is, uh, is it going to be soon when we have like an online brand giving, uh, an online apparel brand giving competition to an offline, uh, the organized retail sector? And second is, how is the social media going to change the fashion scene for men in India? Oh, very good. Good. Very good. 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 Really good online apparel. Yeah. So I, I think it's a very good question. Uh, yes, uh, in times we will certainly have. But right now, I think the reach of social media, I mean, if we purely look at numbers, if we, uh, you know, it is extremely uh, limited. Okay. So yes, there are various brands which are coming up in the online space. For example, Free Culture is one that I can think of right now. But, uh, you know, it is limited. Uh, there are two, three uh, constraints which are there. One is the uh, reach of uh, social media or internet. And second thing is the penetration of e-commerce also. There are a lot of constraints. But as we all know that all both these things are supposed to, let's say, go four times in the next five years. So I'm sure that uh, there will be an online brand which will come up in the next five years. Also, let me tell you that 
it is not very easy to create a fashion brand online because a fashion brand is all about imagery okay and it is extremely difficult to create imagery online okay and so so as far as the branding is concerned it is extremely difficult task to create an online brand so uh, a better way of creating an online brand is to go the product way wherein you you have lot of word of mouth okay your product has lot, uh, has a good price value equation and it sells on its merit okay but it is extremely difficult to create a online brand which has imagery and you know which can sell on its own so that's what uh, mostly brands do they they put in lot of effort in their product the product needs to be clearly differentiated the price value equation needs to be there and that's a much better way of uh, creating an online brand uh, what was the next question and how social media is changing the fashion online very much very much i think that's uh, that's going to be the key i think if men fashion can be changed it can only be done by uh, social media because uh, you know there are certain constraints first of all there there is no platform for men designer to showcase okay there is no men fashion week anywhere and most of the fashion weeks are all about women fashion also you know if you look at the organized retail you know in india for example in terms of organized retail all uh, all the brands men's wear contributes 70% okay but if you look at the designer side of it you know it is all about women's wear okay for example kimaya doesn't sell you know men's wear they are saying there are no buyers for uh, women uh, for men designer wear men designer wear essentially is limited to the sherwanis right now so as as men evolve in their fashion and they they try out designer wear on a normal day also uh, so more and more brands will come in this space and we will have retailers also then uh, start who will start to sell uh, men's wear but there is there is a lot of time because uh, the the organized retail environment is not so friendly uh, that suddenly a new men's store can come in so there is a lot of time to go so i think till that time it will be given only by social media one thing that has happened with fast fashion is that at least uh, men can now get lot of fashionable stuff otherwise if you look at the men's market in india right now the five leading brands which are there in india are louis philip aero zodiac uh, or let's say van heusen they are all formal wear brands okay so fashion uh, for a indian man is all about uh, you know uh, dressing up for an interview or dressing up for your for a function which is like a wedding so right now in the last 2 to 3 years men indian men they have been exposed to fashion and how you know they can have various looks during the day but yeah it, it will change and we will very soon have uh, 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 men becoming more fashionable and they getting platform and retailers also from where they can sell the others want to add and i just sure. want to tell you that if you come and hang out with us at bicrolly all the men here <laughs> <laughs> and you social media people should spread that in the world and say how come to viva bicrolly fashion guy you know fun every day and we don't tell you if you leave or you just come to any gold drop office so i'm very like I don't know about how well they're doing because I don't have the numbers or the data, but I can give you a list of few of my favorite online uh, brands for women. So one of them, my current favorite, is called Coops. We've been sourcing a lot from them. They're really fantastic. One day delivery doesn't work. Send it back there in India, and they're also bringing down a whole bunch of my favorite. Um, so they've got their own brand called Coops, which is only online. But they're also bringing on Oasis and Warehouse and brands. that aren't necessarily available to indian women i'd have to like fly down to london and now i can shop for them and they're based in gurgaon which is great um i like asos.com as well because they're free shipping to india it takes 30 days but it's free hmm come to me at our festival no i have a trick <laughs> what is it tell us now what google and asos are actually saying so the ceo of asos gave us this job Yeah, but it's still different companies. So, I think one of the things that I've noticed, especially in terms of online shopping, I think that it may not necessarily be a new brand that comes up and re replaces in a, you know the the your quintessential normal retail shop, but I think it's going to actually change the way businesses run their their stores. So instead of doing a hundred stores in the city, they'll do maybe one landmark store and then do online shopping. An example, like I said earlier, like a Flipkart has eight hundred and forty brands. So for a girl to go shopping and then spend the afternoon as much as we love it 
running to 850 stores is just not possible. And here you have the option to sort by exactly what you're looking for. So that is going to make a big difference. And also, I think nowadays we've become so greedy for I want it and I want it now and I want it delivered home. You know, so, so that's part of the thing and I think exactly what Pearl said because this process of delivery, especially in India, has improved so much that people are not, like I'm, my mother is so still scared of shopping online or spending, she's like somebody will steal your identity. You know, that's still the fear that our other generation has or that how do you know baby they'll never send it. You know, I'm like, no, because then I will tweet the hell out of them, <laughs> you know? <Sure>. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I think that that fear is going away. And, and you know, I mean, uh, Google did this great report that said 60 million women are online. So that's just the women, and there's even more men, you know? And I think in terms of men's fashion, it's all education. I think that every man in this room would love to do something more stylish and interesting, like you said, if you knew what works and what you can do. So that's part of our job as bloggers, as magazine editors and writers and stylists to say, guys, it's not just about the type and then, you know, what watch. You can do more things. And, and as soon as you know, you'd want to do it because then you'll be cooler than your friends. And also for menswear, like all the luxury brands I've been talking to, um, they're not focusing on ready-to-wear for women. So if all your lucky men out there, you know, all of your all the luxury brands, because with Indian women, you know, we're still, there's still a large majority of Indian women wearing saris, and, you know, but they'll buy Jimmy Choo's. So, like, for women's wear, it, the focus is on um, accessories. And for men's wear, you know, this, they're all men. You're most men here are Western wear. So it's, it's like a big, big, big market. This mic is doing thing because it's telling us, like, you know how you all have in the nightclubs? <laughs> like, like, like that, like that, then they do. So this is that. It means that the shake kebabs are ready. So, um, so, so the roofs are has been so, so you can make schools into uh, shopping and shipping stores, 8 to 10 standards, you can make them into businessmen and they can go around building societies, chalks, baby chalks, slums and sell it. Are you starting a business? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now for, uh, for more Instagram. questions, to, to mob our panelists, um, everything, do it over Sheikh Kabab downstairs.